For Oasis Audio, I'm Wayne Shepherd, talking with the author of Nudge, Leonard Sweet. Len, thanks for your time today. Good to be with you, Wayne. Of course, you've written many other books as well, and they can be checked out online at leonardsweet.com, and we'll give other web addresses in a moment for additional resources. But Nudge, by the way, what a great word, Nudge. It's a, a book on the theme of evangelism. You've obviously written this book in order to reorient our thinking about how to effectively do evangelism, but what's the message of Nudge? Well, basically, that evangelism is a good word, and it, it's not a scary word or a frightful word. And In fact, I think one of the big mistakes we've made is to separate evangelism from discipleship. For me, if you're a disciple, you're an evangelist. So I, I'm right, I've written this book to, to make the case that evangelism and discipleship are basically the, the same thing. The, the, the first century church, evangelism was we found the Messiah, come and see. And what has happened to us in the 21st century is that uh, evangelism, if we do it at all, it's become, we found ourselves, come and see. Or hmm. we found the best church, come and join. Or what, we found the best uh, praise and worship team, come and sing. Or, or we found the best leader, come and fall in. You know, all these other things other than than Christ. Uh, we've been witnessing to our own personal experiences. We've been witnessing to our denominational leaders. We've been with, witnessing to our our little community. Um, I thought maybe it's time to explore a little biblically and, and historically what it might mean to witness to, to Christ. <laughs> you know, what does it mean to actually do evangelism that lifts up Christ, the Christ who forgives and redeems and sanctifies and and to do so in a way, Wayne, that isn't uh, based on listen, Lord, for thy servant is speaking, but mm -hmm. speak, Lord, for thy servant is listening. So yeah. it's, a, it's a little different uh, tack. Uh, you emphasize the senses, and we'll, uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. But in the acknowledgments, which, by the way, are often not included in audiobook editions, but there was a little nugget in the acknowledgments that you mentioned your deconversion from Christianity when you were a teenager— but there was someone in your life who didn't write you off, and you described that person as a as a nudger, someone who nudged you back to faith. Can you tell that story just briefly? Yeah, well, I deconverted when I was 17. I come out of the holiness tradition, and a pilgrim holiness mother and a free Methodist father, and grew up as close to Mennonite, I, I think, as you can get. Um, I had family prayer a couple times a day, very separate from the world. Uh, kind of sub-Christian culture was created. My mother sent us to public schools, but she homeschooled us in Christianity, so it was very insular. And um, 17, that all kind of uh, came crashing down when an incident happened at a camp meeting, and I just said, I'm out of here. And I became an atheist, and and uh, some people sow wild oats. I planted a prairie. I didn't uh, <laughs> forget the wild oats. I, <laughs> I went right to the prairie. So there's like a six, seven-year period when I was uh, very difficult to deal with, from about 16 to 17 to 23, 24. And, but there was somebody, his name is Leonard Humbert, who in the midst of my rebellion and my um, kind of in-your-face flaunting of of my, uh, I don't believe this stuff anymore, and this is all a bunch of bunk, um, he, he just stayed in there and, and just, um, it was just, it was almost like, and I thought like Jesus on the cross was, you know, where God said, uh, give me your best shot, you know. <laughs> you can throw your worst sin at me, and, and I'm still going to love you. There's nothing you can do to make me stop uh, showing you how much I love you. And and he, uh, no matter what I said, no matter how I, you know offensive I got about how um, preposterous this whole thing called Christianity was, he just... He stayed in there and kept nudging me, and and I, I, you know, you look back, would I have been here today without those constant nudging? So I dedicated the book to him. His name is Leonard Humbert, and still alive today. Um, still right in the middle of a bout with cancer right now, oh. but I, I thank God for him. Well, I wanted to mention that because sometimes it does go missed in audiobook editions, and I found it to be just a little interesting insight into your own experience as you write about this. It's subtitled, the book is subtitled, Awakening Each Other to the God Who's Already There. 
What do you mean about the God who's already there? You're, you're talking about uh, the, that sense of a moral right in a person. Uh, what, what do you mean? Well, the, the, we, we make, a, I think, a fundamental error when we think that we take Jesus to anybody as if he didn't arrive on the scene until we got there. I mean, who, <laughs> yeah. How arrogant is that? Yeah. You know? So every, every religious tradition, if, you, if you're out of the Calvinist, Reformed tradition, you call it common grace. If you're out of the more Wesleyan, Arminian tradition, you call it prevenient grace. But there's a sense that long before we ever arrived on the scene, um, God was up to something. And whoever we meet, to begin with the assumption that God is already doing something in this person's life, and the fact that you now are meeting is in some ways a, a divine appointment set up from the beginning of the ages, um, and that um, my job is not to bring Jesus to somebody, is to join so much as to join him in what he's already up to in that person's life. So it shifts the, the focus from uh, show-and-tell evangelism, which is what has dominated the scene for, for too long, to uh, kind of shut up and listen to evangelism. Now, my first job as an evangelist is not to tell you something, it's to draw out of you what um, the story of, and even though you may not think of it this way, but to draw out of you the story of what God is already doing in your life, so that I can join it. I mean, the first rule of a healer is do no harm, and this is very important for Wesley, uh, founder of my tribe, do no harm. And so we, the worst thing we can do is to harm what the Holy Spirit's doing. A lot of evangelism, Wayne, as you know, has really done a lot of harm. Mm -hmm. To um, it's harmed the Holy Spirit. It's harmed what the Spirit has been up to in somebody's life, and actually not joined it and pushed it and nudged it further, but has really uh, handicapped it. So um, that that's the the theological um, the kind of assumption of this of this book. What Wesley and I didn't I didn't quote this in the book, but Wesley had a he had, he had some of his his lieutenants were. Not all that happy about going to where Wesley wanted them to go. You know, go to you visit the miners in their pits and the, the prisoners in their cells, and you go to the poor in their hovels, and you go there and you visit them, and they, well, you know, we don't really want to go there. It's kind of scary. And, <laughs> and Wesley said, this is, this is "Just put it like as I'm quoting here exactly. Um, you go visit the poor in their hovels and the prisoners in their in their cells. Jesus is already there, and he'll be with you." <laughs> And if we looked at that, everybody we meet, everybody we meet, um, God's up to something in their life, and we have a moment and a privilege of joining what Jesus is doing and nudging it a little further. You alluded to this a moment ago, but sometimes we have to help people understand that it is God who is at work in their life. They may not acknowledge that whatsoever. Sometimes we have to start there, don't we? Exactly. And uh and and all we're doing then is, and this is a mistake that we make, is that we're not introducing people to our story. We're introducing people to to his story. Uh, I, I love, uh, my favorite name for a church is St. Andrew, because I love Andrew. <laughs> you know, his, his biblical character, he, he doesn't have a big name like Peter and John and Paul and James and Matthew, Mark. And the Luke, forgotten he disciple, did, yeah. <laughs> he did the one thing, he did over and over again. And what did he do? He introduced people to Jesus. He introduced his brother Simon, this fishing partner of Jesus. And, and Jesus was so impressed with Simon, he gave him a new name. Uh, there were 5,000 of Jesus' listeners to, to be fed, and Andrew introduced a small boy to Jesus. Um, I mean, Andrew's contribution to the history of the church wasn't dramatic, it wasn't uh, innovative, it wasn't inventive. He just simply nudged people to Jesus. He, he just simply constantly nudged people come to Christ, get acquainted with Jesus. And, and when that happened, God did some amazing things. Even when Andrew wasn't there, God did amazing things. And so, for me, he's kind of the patron saint of nudge. I, I almost <laughs> dedicated the book to St. Andrew, because he just, uh, that's what he did. He just, and what, what, what would it mean for us to constantly nudge the Jesus that is already there in people, just wanting to, yeah. wanting to grow and, and share life with, uh, with every human being? And it doesn't lessen our responsibility. If anything, it increases our responsibility, as you say, to listen and to use our other senses to discern uh, what God is up to in a person's life and how we can help them make that connection. Yeah, and, and I did the five senses things. I mean, I know there's maybe eight or nine, some say as many as 20-something senses. There's just not five. But 
the book was already getting long, so I said <laughs> five cents is enough. But uh, there's always a second book. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Uh, but but to, in every one, buddy you meet, this is the this is the basis of knowledge. And everybody you meet leave an impression, but a Jesus impression. I call it a Jesus dent. And what we try and do is we try and impress everyone with ourselves. You know, uh, we want to be impressive. Um, but I, but not just arguing that no, leave, leave a different impression on people, a Jesus impression, and and you can impress them with all of your senses. Impress them with with a Jesus dent. Um, you can impress them with the goodness and the truth and the beauty of Jesus uh, through smell, or through sight, through sound, through taste, and, and through touch. Um, so I, I just, there's a chapter on each one of these how to how to leave that, uh, that that Jesus dent and to see everybody is kind of a divine appointment for nudging. But nudging, you can nudge them. You don't just have to use um, your lips here. You can, you can you can use all your senses yeah. to, to nudge people. What's the word you use? Is it pronounced semiotics? Semiotics. Semiotics. The the reading of signs, right? Well, it, this is a it's not my word. It's a Jesus word. It's it, Jesus had this favorite saying, I say, that the red sky in morning, sailors take warning, red sky at night, sailors delight. And uh, when I say that, people, that's not in the Bible, I have to show them where it is. But then, um, then he went on and said, you know how to read the signs of the sky, I want you to know how to read the signs of the times. And the Greek word for sign here is, uh, we get our word semiotics from a uh, study of signs. And, and the ultimate sign we're to uh, read is Jesus. He's the ultimate sign. So how do we read the signs of his appearing in somebody's life? How do we read the signs of his appearing in our life and in the world? And and so I, I, I almost at the point where, you know, you don't get a, a driver's license without passing a semiotics test. <laughs> you gotta you gotta show that you can read the signs. Yeah, what does that yield sign mean, right? Yeah, exactly. And you, you don't you don't get to balance a checkbook until you learn a semiotic language called mathematics. <laughs> And I'm almost at the point there. We almost need. You know, the, I, I'm not for standardized tests, but let, let's start testing here. To see <laughs> how well you could read the signs of of uh, another sign, spiritual signs, the signs of of Christ appearing, and the ultimate sign again is Jesus Himself, yeah. and, and and help people see the signs in their own life. Bingo. Yeah. Well, what's Jesus up to in your life, and where where is He appearing in your life, and how do you know that, and how? And how, then how's he appearing in somebody else's life so you can nudge that along and and, um, and be a, a nudger, not a shover. Mm-hmm. Um, well, uh, Len, what change would you like to see in people who read and listen to Nudge? Obviously, you didn't write this just to write about something. You you want to see change in people. What's that change? Well, I, I, I want to... Um, I want to see conversions. I mean, I want to see people coming to Christ. And, and I, we, we have right now in the church today the worst crisis any species can have, Wayne, and that, that's a reproduction crisis. Um, the church cannot, right now in the West, the church cannot reproduce itself. We can't reproduce the faith in our children. We can't reproduce the faith in uh, our churches. When you have a reproduction crisis, uh, the handwriting's on the wall. And so we have a, a the, as I say, just the worst uh, crisis anybody anybody can have. So I, I'm for right now. Let's. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that the nudge will help to help this worst crisis that um, any organism can can be a part of, and that's to have a reproduction crisis. And let's let's deal with it. I mentioned the website earlier, LeonardSweet.com. There are other websites as well. Of course, there's Sermons.com which people can check out. And then there's a specific website that David C. Cook has set up for this book, nudgethebook.com. Additional resources, I understand, are available there. Yeah, and, and we're, we're really trying to... I initially titled the book, Pay Attention, Every Bush is Burning. <laughs> and um, that was Jesus, one of Jesus' favorite words. We translated, verily, verily, I say unto thee, or I tell you the truth, but really it's pay attention. I mean, he's constantly <laughs> saying pay attention. And, and so with these, the, all these resources there to help people And how, how can you see every person you meet as a burning bush of God's activity? And, and how, do you, how do you share in that shining of, of that presence of, 
of God that wants to burst forth in, in everyone's life. So, Well, we skip so many signs all the time in our Absolutely. rush in our rush of life, don't we? Boy, that's a good, yeah, that's a good yeah. word. It really is. Well, again, it's nudgethebook.com, leonardsweet.com, sermons.com, other websites as well. Len, thanks for your time. I know that not everybody agrees with you all the time, but you do make us think, and you make us think deeply about the things of God, and we sure appreciate that about you. I appreciate you, Wayne. Thank you. Leonard Sweet, the author of Nudge, Awakening Each Other to the God Who's Already There, now available as an audiobook from Oasis Audio. And for Oasis, I'm Wayne Shepherd.